make Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Let's lift our Bibles up, wave them around, make Jesus glad and the devil mad. Say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. I'm glad to remind myself and others of how great you are. And you have a great word for me today. And your Holy Spirit is here to bring it into reality in my spirit. And I thank you for what's going to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated and uh, live stream. Please uh, follow along in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, please. And uh, before I get into the message, I just want to, I was thinking about this the other day. I used to say it more often, so I have to remind myself to say it. You know, give me a year of your life. I invite you. Give me a year of your life. And I heard that 40 plus years ago. When I had just uh, started going to Lakewood, it was so far from my house that I thought, you know, I couldn't go there all the time. It's, it's uh, 28 miles each way. It's on the other side of town. And I just had it built up in my mind that it wasn't practical to go there all the time. And so I stayed in the Catholic Church most of the time. And about once a month, I'd go over there. Then one time after a few months, I heard him say that, give me a year of your life. And it kind of hit me. And, uh, and then I read in my Bible about a couple of weeks after that, I read in my Bible where that how, God, how Jesus in his own hometown could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. And how Jesus said that the traditions of men render the word of God in none effect. And I remembered my Baltimore catechism that said the Catholic church is the one true church created by God and its, and its foundation is scripture and tradition equal. And I'd already been offended by the traditions of their, of their men because I'd seen that they had changed. I mean, does God change? But when I got saved, see, my, my, you know, I started questioning some of the things that I'd been raised on. And, and you know what? I, I made that decision to give Brother Osteen a year of my life. It turned into 15 years. And this church is a result of it. So, you know, we live in a time right now where people are kind of floating around. Their church left them in many cases. They come up and tell, tell me, you know, the first time guests, I'll get to meet them. And they'll tell me their story. I had one that said, you know, the church turned woke. Pastor accused all the people of being, you know, white supremacists. We need to repent. What a bunch of garbage. It's just the communist propaganda is what it is. What kind of an idiot would say that from the pulpit? Not me. I know my Bible. We're new creations. We're new creatures. We never before existed. Shut up about your racism. You're not right. You're not black. You're not brown. You're not white. You're a new creature. You know race. You don't need any reparation. Oh, I'm getting off. All right. So we could all get reparations. Our government has cheated, our, cheated them, us out of billions, trillions, Amen. robbing us blind. We need, rep well, everybody needs a reparation. <laughs> oh, I'm really off of it now. I was starting. <laughs> Give me a year of your life. Well, let's see if this is rubbing you wrong. Well, you don't belong here. Go keep, keep looking. But if you like what I'm saying, hey, you've been going, you're like a grasshopper, you know, just popping from one place to that. How's it working for you? You're not designed to do that as a Christian. You're designed to plant somewhere. Well, I just don't know. I'd, well, give me a year. What have you got to look? Give me a year. And after a year, if you don't like it, you can leave then. <laughs> At least you took me up on my word. But it takes me a year to preach messages like I'm going to share with you this morning. It takes me a year to give you the whole counsel of the Word of God. That's why I ask you to give me a year. I mean, after a year, I didn't want to leave Osteen, Brother Osteen. I didn't want to leave Dodie. I didn't want to leave what I was getting. But that might not be you. Me, You might be here a year. Some people are here six months. Some people are here a year, and then I don't see them. And, and I don't call them and say, hey, where are you? And we have, you know, we have give you an opportunity to find out whether you belong here or not. 
And so this message this morning is a, is a real key message for your Christian life. It'll take me a couple of weeks to preach it, but let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, give me a year of your life if you haven't, and that doesn't mean that you have to join us and be an official member even. We don't require that. We give you an opportunity that's coming up here pretty quick. We're going to have a, a new member's uh, class, and it's, it's not any obligation for you to be a member once you complete the class. It's really an investigation on your side and our side. We get them to kind of know you too. See if, see if you belong here. We just want the ones that belong here. Sometimes it takes a little while to discover that. Like I've told you my testimony about Lakewood. I had to overcome mental, false mental ideas. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul's writing to the Corinthians and to us. He says, what? <laughs> See, I like, to, I like to say it like I think he said it. What? <laughs> don't you know don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you which you have of God and you're not your own question mark <laughs> hey you're not your own newsflash you're not your own you don't belong to yourself for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so I wanted to uh, start a message entitled Cooperating with the Holy Ghost. Cooperating with the Holy Ghost. This is, uh, you know, I teach a lot on faith. I teach on healing here recently and let, turning things around the last couple of weeks. I'll teach a lot on faith because our faith needs to be fed. But on the flip side of that, we need the spirit. We need to know how to cooperate with the third person of the Godhead that's actually living on the inside of us. Amen. Years ago, I, I, I realized that, that, that really this cooperating with the Holy Ghost is the epitome of humility. When you realize that you don't belong to yourself, when you realize that that the Holy Ghost lives on the inside. Everywhere you go, He goes. Everything you do, He's doing with you. I call it being God inside minded. You know, the church is not very God inside minded. I have to say. In 43 years of being saved, 35 years of being an ordained minister, Next January 29th, I'll enter, this church will enter its 30th year. We're 29th anniversary. We're going into our 30th year next year. All next year, we're going to talk about that 30th year. Amen. We're in this thing. This is not a fly-by-night church. This is not a cult. This is not uh, a Johnny-come-lately. It deserves honor and respect for, you know, Really, these verses are talking about you individually, but it's talking about the Corinthian church corporately. The Holy Ghost dwells in them corporately. And that they need to be God inside minded when it comes to coming together. The Holy Ghost is here. You all feel him. <laughs> I mean, he, he's tangible here this morning. Those, those, I mean, that, it, they hit the second song and it just went, you know, hard to stand up out there. What is that? That is the presence of God. And so, uh, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Every believer has the Holy Ghost living inside of them. And every Bible-believing, Spirit-yielding church and assembly has a Spirit, Spirit of God living inside of them collectively. I like 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No matter what's going on, you've got the greater one living inside of you. He's for you. He's with you. That last song, the blessing. And so, um, in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus began to teach the disciples 
started with 12 and then one of the 12 left, that was Judas, and he finished teaching about the Holy Ghost after Judas left the room to go out to betray him. I mean, right at the last minute, he starts talking to them about the Holy Spirit and he called the Holy Spirit the comforter or really the Greek is parakletos. And comforter in the King James, it's, it, it is not a, it's a poor translation of the word. You know, the Greek language is a, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I've got books and I can consult my concordance and I've got other books and I can get a sense of what the meaning of the word is. And, you know, comforter is just not really that much of what the Holy Ghost does. I like the Amplified. It kind of tells you a little bit more. The Amplified, when you read John 14, it, it says the comforter is the counselor, helper, intercessor. Oh, play for me. Well, the Holy Ghost is inside. He's praying for you. Is that good enough or not? Or do you need more? You need more prayer? You need somebody else to pray for? You need a whole army? People have the idea if I can get an army of people praying, but you've got the intercessor. You've got the Holy Ghost praying for you. How does that work? I don't know. You can ask him when you see him. God praying to God. The third person praying to the first person. He's so humble, the Spirit of God is. He's not going to elbow his way to the forefront. He is not going to insist that you pay attention. He is going to lead you. He's going to guide you. And it's up to you to cooperate, which is why we're giving you this message. I believe it'll help you live in a successful manner. God wants you to be successful. He's not against you. He's for you. He's not trying to make things complicated. He's trying to ease you. He's trying to bring you into the fullness of what he's created you to do. Amen. All this message to help you. So, you know, he's the intercessor, the advocate. You need an attorney. He's your attorney. When you mess up, he represents you to the father. He doesn't condemn you. I hear people say this a lot in Christianity, and I try to teach people better, but, but uh, the Bible says uh, that the Holy Ghost convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Everybody say convicts. convicts. Who? The world. the world. Are you in the world? No. Well, you're in the world, but what? You're not of the world. So he doesn't convict you of sin. Huh? I hear, I've heard Christians all the time. Oh, the Lord convicted me. No, he didn't. Well, the Holy Ghost convicted me. No, he didn't. He doesn't do that to the believer. Why? Because you've been born again and he's not the accuser. Who is the accuser? The devil. I'll tell you who does remind you when you miss the mark and that's your own spirit. Your conscience hurts you. You get into the word of God and pray in the Holy Ghost, then your conscience will let you know when you've missed it. In fact, sometimes if you just get sensitive enough, you don't need any kind of a voice to tell you you missed it. You just feel bad and you know, you recognize, oh man, I missed it. Lord, forgive me. I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. And right then you get it taken care of, 1 John 1, 9, and then he cleanses you of all unrighteousness. He forgives you and he forgets it. No, only person that remembers it, you and the devil. So you need to forget it. Well, how about penance? No, the penance is not in the Bible. That's another Catholic tradition that you're going to have to get over. Some of you are Catholic. How many of you are Catholic? Oh, you don't have to lift a hand. But anyway, <laughs> I'd rather not know. Anyway, I spent that first few months after I got saved thinking that God was going to use me with Catholics. Well, he has. I guarantee you, I've preached to more Catholics than anybody. I've been to the, I mean, I've been to the Catholic capital of the world, Philippines. You talk about Catholics. I had the nuns protested me. They were carrying signs. <laughs> so he's your strengthener. He's your standby. He's the one called alongside to help. Think about God standing by you. Oh, my goodness. How much help do you really need? See, I'm, I'm talking about cooperating with the Holy Ghost now. 
And so he, he taught them a little bit, John chapter 14, 15, and 16. He says, I've got so many things to share, share with you, but you cannot bear them now. He couldn't teach them all that he could have, and he waited till the end. Why? Because they're not spirit They're not born again yet. He hadn't died on the cross yet. There's only so much they can understand of the Holy Spirit. They didn't, even though they were anointed of the Holy Spirit to get the sick healed and devils cast out, they were anointed. They had the Spirit of God upon them when he sent them out first, you know, the 12 and then the 70. They were familiar with the anointing upon them, but they didn't have it inside them. He said, you can't bear it yet. And so I like what one Bible scholar said about Paul's ministry. He preaches the things that went to heaven with Jesus unuttered, untaught. Jesus had to keep those things to himself. And that's why he brought uh, Paul up to heaven to share with him this gospel of in Christ. I mean, man, you, you've got to get that revelation. And this is part of it here in 1 Corinthians. So... <clears throat> You know, he's not just here today and gone tomorrow like, like people are, like relationships are, even like churches are. No, he's forever. He's in there. He does, you know, some people think they sin and the Holy Ghost leaves. Where would he, where would he go? And they, they're just constantly, oh, and I, I, one famous preacher, I won't mention his name, but he, he got on TV after he was caught in terrible sin, and it was just really embarrassing for his family and his ministry. It ruined his ministry. It was so public. I'm not going to, you probably know who it is, but I don't care. I'm not interested in demeaning him. I'm using what he did as an example of somebody that doesn't know his Bible like he thinks he does. And he prayed David's prayer oh, in front of the whole congregation after they knew what he had done. Holy Spirit, oh God, God, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Well, what a bunch of bunk. I, re I heard that. I thought, you don't even know what you're talking about, man. You, yeah, you sin, but the Holy Ghost ain't going nowhere. You're not lost. See, he's, he's, he's comparing himself to David. Well, David was Old Testament. And David prayed that prayer because of Saul. Saul, God took the Holy Ghost off of Saul and he rejected him for his sin. That was not, that's not the same at all. That's the anointing to men. That's the anointing of king. That has nothing to do with being lost or saved. So there's a lot of Pentecostal teaching going around where people just feel like they're lost every time they feel like it they feel lost they come to the altar and rededicate see that's a bunch of bunk stop it he's not gone anywhere he's with you he's in you he's for you he didn't convict you he's not accusing you just go ahead and get right just go ahead and get right and, and get it under the blood and get on down the road I don't know who this is for but anyway all right so, he's in us for our benefit. It's all benefit. It's all, it, it's all a blessing. He's not in you to condemn you. He's not in you to spy on you. He's not in you to find fault with you. He's in you to help you. Really, the shortest definition of, of, of paraclete is helper. He's here to help you. And when you don't cooperate with the helper, then you're cheating yourself. How many of you determined not to cheat yourself? <laughs> Amen. All right. So I want to give you four areas. Everybody say four areas. four areas. In which it's vital to cooperate with the Holy Ghost. Vital. What I, when you go to the doctor, what do they do? They check your vital signs. You check temperature, check your blood pressure, your pulse. Old Jewish doctors would take you by the hands and feel your hands. They'd get you to stick out your tongue. They'd look at your tongue. They'd look up your nose. They'd look in your ears. They could do more with just that amount of observation than most of these fancy million-dollar pieces of equipment they have down there now. They just knew how to doctor people. Why would you say Jewish? Well, because of most of the doctors are Jewish, or were, back, back when I grew up. And uh, <clears throat> so... It's vital. What is it vital? It means it, your life depends on it. 
I said, your life depends on it. It's vital for you to cooperate with the Holy Ghost in these four areas. What are they? What, I'm not going to get all four up today, but I'll name them right now up front. Cooperate with the Holy Ghost. Be God inside minded. Think about the fact you don't belong to yourself. Amen. This is the epitome of humility. When you let God, number one, be, be controlled by the Holy Ghost. Number two, be led by the Holy Ghost. Number three, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Number four, have fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Let's go through it again. Now, this is, this is what I'm going to teach you probably first two today, maybe, if I get past the first one. That's the beauty about being a pastor. I don't have to give you the whole load this Sunday. I can, give, I can just dole it out as it, as it comes out. Amen. But uh, I'm going to teach you to cooperate with the Holy Ghost in these four areas. Be controlled by the Holy Ghost. Be led by the Holy Ghost. Uh, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And have fellowship with the Holy Ghost. So we start with be controlled by the Holy Ghost. We notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we are not our own. We are bought with a price. Therefore, what? We should glorify God in our body. In our body and in our spirit, which are God's. Now, he wrote this to Corinthian church. I want to remind you what came out in our teaching week before last and last week about the Corinthian church, because I was reading out of 1 Corinthians 1 last week and the week before about turning things around. The Corinthian church, Paul said in verse 7, you come behind in no good gift. They were a spirit-filled church. They were a tongue-talking church. They spoke in tongues. They had gifts of the spirit. They had disorder in their services. He had to address that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 13 and 14. They had a lot of problems in their church. They came out of the occult. They had a background in the dark arts. And so they were not unfamiliar with the spirit realm, but they'd been thoroughly familiar with the wrong end of the spirit realm. And so, you know, they loved being in the spirit and the Holy Ghost. They loved that, but they, they had a lot of dysfunction. And then he said, and, and so he, he congratulated him. He said, you know, you come behind in no good gift. And, uh, and then he said, you know, some, some of you, you know, some of you were foolish. Some of you were weak. Some of you were base. God delights in calling those things, you know. And we, we went through all those verses. But then in chapter 3, he said, you know, you're, it, it's reported that you guys have cliques and factions. Some of you are bragging that you were baptized of Paul and some are baptized of Apollos and you have respect of persons. You've got your little internal cliques and clubs that nobody can gain entrance to. This is a church. Everybody ought to know everybody and everybody ought to be able to get along with everybody. Ideally, if the Holy Ghost is really in charge of you. <laughs> and so <laughs> he said, uh, it, 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 you're, you're living, you're, you're carnal, you're carnal and living as mere men. You're carnal, your body rule, carnal means body rule. Well, what did he say in chapter six later on? He said, well, you need to glorify God in that body of yours instead of how it's been. Instead of having cliques and divisions and factions and fusses and strife and division. You're not letting, you're not, you're not glorifying God in your body. You're letting your body rule you. You're not allowing the Holy Ghost to control you. Are y'all now, you're getting, getting hey, pictures brightening up. So he had a purpose for writing this. Well, just travel down 2,000 years right to us now. See, we, I teach this on, on a fairly regular basis. Why do I teach it? Because everybody needs this. We have to develop in these things. We don't, look, you, when you get saved, what, a, what about a baby? A baby's got to have all kind of care, doesn't it? You can't send the baby out to uh, mow the grass. Okay, baby, go in there. You need to clean this room. This room is a mess. You need to clean this. No, the baby's laying there. That's all it can do is lay there. It mainly sleeps. When it's awake, it cries. 
It's either hungry or it's pooping or it's, you know, it's doing something <laughs> that requires you to take care of it. Well, it's no different in the church. A baby Christian needs a constant care. They need constant nurturing. And hopefully they get uh, fed enough and they get nurtured enough to where they can start then to grow in these different things about allowing the Holy Spirit to control them. You know, at first you don't. We're all different stages. I mean, you know, fruit is grown, but gifts are given. See, they came behind in no good gifts. They had the gifts of the Spirit. Those are given. You might be talking tongues. You might prophesy. You might, and yet you might be way down the list of being controlled by the Holy Ghost because that's something that you've never really paid much attention to. Well, now it's time to start paying attention. These four things all fit together. They dovetail together. And so it's, if it were possible to do one without doing the other, I don't know that it is, but if it were, you wouldn't do the thing that you are doing as well. You need all four, working on all four of them. So this first one, controlled by the Holy Ghost, it affects being led by the Holy Ghost. which, And then, of course, being filled with the Holy Ghost affects the other two. And then con fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Well, if you're not controlled by the Holy Ghost, you're not going to have much fellowship with it. You see what I'm saying? So it begins to, it be, they all dovetail together. They're all important. And we're all at various levels. And why, why am I preaching? Because we have knowledge of something, and yet we have the, what we're doing. The gap between knowing something and doing something has to be closed. Where are you going to close it? In church. You learn how to close the gaps in your life. That's my job. If I don't do it, I'll stand before Jesus and give an account of my pastoring. Well, you know, Griner, you just gave them the high spots. You didn't get into the difficult areas. You didn't give them anything to chew on. You didn't show them how they could do better in this area. See, he's, he's trying, what's he doing? Is he fussing at them? No, he's trying to get them to elevate. Trying to get them back out of the mess that they've created. We'll get more into that mess here in a minute. You know, Holy Ghost is not afraid of any kind of mess. He's the master at correcting messes and cleaning them up. <laughs> all right, so they're carnal, they're body rule. They've got factions, favorites. They've got uh, all kind of problems. They've got sin in the camp. We'll find about, out about that chapter, next chapter, chapter uh, uh, actually, the last chapter, chapter 5, we, didn't, we skipped over chapter 5. There was sin in the camp. He said it's reported in chapter 5. It says it's reported that there's such fornication among you, such as not even been named among the heathen, that a man would have his father's wife. And how do you put up with that? How do you put up with a man bringing his stepmother to church and living together in sin and you don't rebuke that and you don't require that to stop. You should have handed this man over. Never, never said anything about the woman. That's curious. Could be that she's not saved. She might not be saved. But he is saved because what, he, what did he tell him? That he, told, he told the Corinthian church, you should have handed this young man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit would be saved in the day of judgment. So he is saved. He is saved and he's sinning openly in front of everybody. Why? Well, he probably doesn't know any better. He hadn't heard anything in that church that would t make him feel like that that's wrong. Well, you know, I don't preach the don't do's. Well, you better preach some of the do's at least. Fornication is a don't do. Adultery is a don't do. So, uh, <laughs> so he's handed over to say, hey, Pastor, what do you mean? How did that? Well, that's the mercy of God. In other words, if he continues along the life of sin, Bible says sin, that you can be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hard-hearted. 
We're to be tenderhearted. Where's your heart? It's your spirit. Your recreated human spirit begins to get dull when sin is not confronted and, uh, and put under the blood and admitted to. And you, you get forgiven then. Or you forgive others when you start walking in love. And if you don't walk in love, you, you, you know, your conscience hurts you, but you're too proud to get it right. You'd rather hold a grudge. You know, you keep doing that. And what's going to happen is you get hard-hearted and then spiritual things are, bec- are going to become distant to you. I grew up a part of my life. I was born here in, in Houston and grew up in Glena Park till the third grade. In the fourth grade, we moved to Refurio. In Refurio, you know, we had, we had uh, television stations in Corpus Christi is 50 miles away. And you, can, you turn the TV on with a little old, uh, rabbit ears, you're going to get nothing but snow. So my dad bought a 30-foot, he was an early adopter. He had a big old mast. This thing was four inches in diameter, big old, big old mast. It had a big old gigantic. It was bigger than the roof of the house. Big old antenna. And it had a motor on the side with a cable ran to a thing on our set. And you could, tur- you could turn that thing and that whole, that whole uh, antenna would turn and pick up the signal from Corpus on ABC, CBS, and NBC uh, channels. And that's the only way we could watch television. So if you flick the channel from ABC to CBS, it'd be snowy. So you get over there and turn the knob and it chick, 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 chick. And then it'd clear up and you'd watch that for a while. Forget about channel surfing. You're not going to channel surf. (laughs) Besides that, you've only got three channels. What happened? Well, there's interference. See, when you sin, you, you create interference between the Holy Ghost and you. You, you create interference. You're not, re- you know, God's sending the signal, but you're not receiving it. Are y'all with me now? It's imperative that we cooperate with the Holy Ghost and let him control us and give glory to him in our body. We can, we can give glory to God in our body. We don't have to blame our body for all the shortcomings. Well, you know, it's just the flesh. I know I'm just wired like that. Well, get unwired. Train your body. You know, you can train a dog, you can train your body. I mean, you train a little dog to jump through a ring of fire. Have you ever seen these? You know, they used to have the Ed Sullivan show. I used to live to watch Ed Sullivan on that TV there in Refurio. I watched I, I watched Elvis on Ed, Ed Sullivan, his first uh, unveiling. And that, and that TV was pretty good shape. I mean, we made sure that it was tuned right in. No, no snow. And uh, so, so we, we, need to, we need to make adjustments so that, uh, that we can hear God his control mechanism. See, we've got this receiver that, he, that he's putting a signal to. Amen. Are you getting this now? So, uh, in Romans 6, 13, it tells us we have to yield our members as, as instruments of righteousness unto God. Well, where is God? Well, he's right in here. He's not way up there. He's right here. What does it mean? Yield your, in, uh, wep, uh, your members. Well, your body parts, yield your eyeballs, your mouth, your hands, your feet, your whole body, you yield it, you submit it, you, you offer it up to God as an instrument or weapon of righteousness. Word instrument really means weapon, a weapon of righteousness. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says it this way, that we should, concerning our former manner of life, See, put off the old man, which is corrupt according to its deceitful lust. See, your your flesh, the body you live in, really down on the inside of it, its flesh, not your spirit, but your flesh, it wants to do what it's always done. It wants to do what it did when you were lost. It would be perfectly content if you were, if you were a drunk, it would be perfectly content to get drunk. Why don't you? Well, because you control your body. Hopefully, hopefully you do. I've seen people that slipped. They were addicted to maybe drugs or alcohol. And then they, they slip and, and maybe a time of pressure, a time of whatever, and they just slip and they start slipping back into that, 
into that habit. Well, that, that, does that mean they're going to hell? No, it doesn't mean they're going to hell. It means they just need to glorify God in their bodies. That's all it means. Require a little bit more of yourself, your spirit. See, build your spirit up and your body will fo follow. You can train your body. I mean, how many of you, you just naturally get up at five o'clock in the morning? There are not very many people. But if it's necessary, see, the, your body clock is such that you get up at 5 o'clock, even though you don't absolutely have to, you do. But you're there. See, there's only one hand in the hole, and that's Loretta, everybody. Oh, there's several, okay. There's several of you. Well, good for you. Can you stay up till midnight? No. Okay, see. I rest my case. So you can train your body. You can train your body to, to do what's necessary for your life to work. I mean, you've got to get up in order to get ready so you can go to work and drive downtown. If you work down, you're going to have to adjust your schedule so you know what you can do. You can adjust your, your body. You can make your body do what it doesn't want to do when the alarm clo clock goes off. I mean, I never have understood snooze. Snooze button doesn't work for me. If I hit the snooze button... I, I lay there and I know I'm supposed to get up and I'm dreading getting up. Oh, just get up and get it over with. But some people want to delay. So they hit the snooze button, five minutes, 10 minutes. Well, you better not keep hitting it because you're going to not go into work. And then what if you get docked? What if you get fired? What if you get docked? What if you, you know, so you train, you know, you can train your body, right? My point is you can, you, who's you spirit, your spirit can train, require things of your flesh. That's called yielded to God. That's called putting off the old man. And then it says in four, uh, Ephesians 4, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Glory to God. I wish you'd get on something exciting. This is hard to listen to. This is the difference between victory and and defeat in every area it really is he's in there for your benefit he's not in there to give make things bad he's he's in there for you if you cooperate with the holy ghost i'm telling you it's wonderful so all of this as you know is all part of growing up you know in ephesians 4 it says we need to all grow up into him Part of growing up is requiring more of yourself. So you see that in, in your children. Your children start off, and they're, they're hard to depend on. They're not necessarily dependable. They, they get distracted. That's just part of maturity. You know, their, their, their attention span, and, and it's what's proven now, if you allow, allow your child just unlimited amounts of time on uh, their telephone and, and their apps and stuff like that, you're going to have a whole lot of trouble. They've got a lot of trouble in school. Most of it's because of social media and what they're learning on places like TikTok. Get rid of TikTok. It's a communist plot to destroy our young people. They are, they are uh, putting stuff on there that creates dopamine in their brain uh, always having a video that's a short duration that has a good fulfilling ending. And so they seek to have that over and over and pretty soon they can never be satisfied with life as it really is. They're only satisfied with this illusion that the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party owns TikTok. Are you going to wake up and quit allowing that in your house? You have to take their phone away. Take it away. I mean, it's, it's worse things can happen. Anyway, I don't know who that's for. Praise the Lord. It's for somebody. We need to wake up. So, but we grow up. See, kids have to grow up. And, and, we, and, and that's the same way in your spirit. You're going to grow in these things. So you, nobody's perfected. I'm still working on all these things that I'm preaching about. I'm working on them. And I, and I fall short. And, and who, who, to, who did God correct? No, I did. I know when I fall short because I read my Bible. And when I read my Bible and I see something I haven't really done very well on, then I see, oh, there's a gap. I need to close that gap right there. Are y'all with me now? Romans 8, 11, I liked, I quoted this verse recently in, in regards to healing. It's, and it's true. Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised Christ from the dead 
shall also quicken your mortal bodies. And that's true of healing. I mean, you know, the Holy Ghost inside of you can keep you in health. He can bring life into your flesh. But I'll tell you something else. There's another aspect of the Holy Ghost as we allow him to control us. And that is he will quicken our mortal flesh, our, our death-doomed flesh. He can quicken it and make it more amenable to training, more uh, easily tamed and trained. Are y'all with me now? I mean, yeah, you know, if, if left to its own devices, your flesh would tend to do all kinds of things that it used to do, but it's not left to its own device because you, your spirit, with a renewed mind are in charge of your flesh and you require certain standard of your fleshly behavior and you won't allow other things. Just like you won't allow sickness to dwell in your body, you resist sickness, well, you're going to resist anything else that's wrong. You're going to resist anger. Well, you know, I've just, I'm just wired that way. I've got a short temper. I've always had a short temper. Well, you know, why don't you do what the Bible says? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. James says that. That's what we should do. That's the standard, not a quick temper. You know who else had a quick temper? Moses had a quick temper. Guess what happened? He never dealt with it until the end. He got so mad, he struck for the second time the rock, violated the type and shadow, and his punishment was he didn't get to go in the promised land. Now, we don't get punished. We got a better covenant than Moses. Jesus took our punishment. But let me tell you something. Sin does have wages. And it is death. Not God giving it to us. Not God that gives us the wages. It's the devil. The devil gives us the wages. So sin can open a door to Satan to steal, kill, and destroy. That's my point. So it behooves us then to cooperate with the Holy Ghost because he wants us to close all the, the doors and lock them. Everybody say, I'm closing all the doors and lock them. The Holy Ghost will quicken your mortal flesh and make it easier to train. Boy, I'm kind of glad to know that. All right. You getting anything out of this? All right, one more. I think I'll get into lead by the Holy Spirit. Might not finish this part, but I've got next week. All right. Romans uh, 8, 14. Let's turn there. Uh, you know, again, uh, you have to purpose in your heart for these things to happen. They're just not automatic. They just don't happen just because. You have to set yourself up, put yourself in position. So Romans 8, 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How many of you believe that's true? Amen. Not every hand went up. Okay, come on, lazy bones. I'm going to throw the chalk and hit you in the head with it. Uh, <laughs> as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How many of you believe that's true? Okay. Well, then the converse is also true. As many as are sons of God, they are led by the Spirit of God. It's not a question of whether God is leading you. He is leading you. He's been leading you ever since you got saved. I know some of you are looking at me like, wait a minute. Yeah? Because he gave you that receiver down on the inside. He gave you that, that, little, that little thing on the set top that you turn. And you can tune into his frequency. He gave it to you. It's called your spirit. And that's where he leads you. Doesn't lead you in your flesh. Doesn't lead you in your brain. He leads you in your spirit. And so it's not a question of whether God is leading you. It's a question of whether you are identifying and obeying that leading. So herein is the thing that you'll grow in the rest of your life. I'm still growing in it. I'm still, you know, I mean, I, I preach out of all the times that I missed his leading didn't identify his leading or I didn't obey his leading. I preach about it a lot because I had to live it. And Claire's quick to say that she lived it. And Jay, dude, they, they quick to say that, that we were there when he did that and we know what it was like. <laughs> it affected them. It always affects you, everybody, it affects your family. And so, uh, so every believer is led by the spirit. That's not a question. The question is, are you 
identifying. Are you following his lead? You know, it reminds me of the old bumper sticker, lead, follow, or get out of the way. You know, <laughs> you know he, he wants us to follow his lead. He is leading continually. He's leading. So um, how does he lead? A couple of verses down. Verse 16, the spirit himself, itself or himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He bears witness. So that is the primary way God leads us is through the witness of the spirit. That's how you know you're saved. You receive this knowing that God gave it to you. The moment you believed in your heart, and confessed with your mouth. You believed what? That God, that Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead. He died for your sin. The minute you believed that and you said, Jesus is my Lord, confessed with your mouth, Lordship. Control, he's controlling me now. How does Jesus control you? Through his word and through his spirit. There's no such thing any other way for him to control you. It controls you by you reading your Bible and knowing what the truth is and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And the Word and the Spirit always agree. That's why, you know, years ago, I, you know, I, I was talking to a couple and, and, and they were having marriage trouble and, and, and uh, I forget which one of them said this, but they said, you know, I just think that we miss God and and got married. We're just not the best for each other. We just want to get a divorce. I said that. Yeah, I just really believe God showed me that. I said, no, no, God didn't show you that. The devil showed you that. God's not in the business of breaking up marriages. You just need, you both need to change. You both need to grow toward Jesus. And if you both start growing toward Jesus, you'll get, you'll get all your trouble taken care of. <laughs> it automatically happens. You start walking to more and more agreement. The more agreement, agreement you are with Jesus, as a husband in more agreement with Jesus you are as a wife, then you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be fine. They didn't. They didn't. See, they just they didn't want to be controlled by the Holy Ghost. They wanted to be, have control. They, they, wanted, they wanted to decide. They wanted to see, You know, if Jesus is Lord, he's going to have something to say about where you live, where you go to church, who you marry. Uh, you know, what you do for a living. I mean, he's got th everything that you can think of that needs a decision, God has a side. Everybody say, God has a side. So his leading is to show you his side, but he does it how? By the witness of the Spirit. A know you have a knowing. I mean, you know, for most of us, Jesus didn't appear to you and say, you're saved. You didn't hear a voice from heaven, thou art saved. You didn't hear a voice. You didn't see a vision. You didn't have a dream. How did you know you had a knowing? That's the witness. The burden of sin rolled away. You know, we, we have words to describe a spiritual thing that happened to all of us when we got saved. But the bottom line is we knew we were saved by the witness of the Spirit. Wouldn't it follow then that the primary way God leads us in the rest of all of our lives, if he started out that way, why would he have to jump to something like a vision across the sky, like, like write it across the sky? A lot of, you know, you know if, if God wrote everything across the sky or you went to your computer and you got an email or you got a text, oh, God is texting me. Yes, Lord. No, he, that's just not how. Listen, it takes faith to follow the witness of the Spirit. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to miss God. Well, he's going to, not going to leave you or forsake you or condemn you. He's going to be with you. Everybody say the witness of the Spirit. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. You know, we, we take for granted television, but I remember when I had radio. I listened to radio. We gather around the living room and listen to the radio. And you just had to imagine the stories they'd have. They'd have programs just like, like a TV program, a, a sitcom or a, a drama or something like that. But it's all sound effects and voices and 
footsteps and doors closing and all of that stuff. And y'all, some of you are looking at me like I'm nuts. But you know, think, to think that you could get a picture moving in your living room of actual people. I mean, it's just like magic. It's like, it's like amazing. God I couldn't take my eyes off the television. I had to have glasses pretty quick after that. I'd lay on the floor and look right at the television, you know. You better move back. You're going to need glasses. My mother didn't know the word of faith. She confessed glasses over me. But it's, it's similar. I mean, it's a supernatural. The witness of, of the Spirit is supernatural. Yes, visions are supernatural. Dreams are supernatural sometimes. Sometimes dreams are from the devil. Sometimes dreams are from pizza. So, so leadership by dreams and visions can be hacked. They can be hacked by the devil. The devil can give you something that you're looking. God, just get, I need something more. I, 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 I've got to have a word. I've got to have a word. The devil can give you a word. The devil can come as an angel of light. He can appear to you as an angel of light, the Bible says. So the most de- dependable safe way to know God's will and leading in any situation is following the witness of the Spirit because the devil can't hack that. Everybody say, I'm unhackable in my spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands right now. Glory to God. That's worth coming to church for right there. I'm unhackable. <laughs> so what is the witness? Well, it's just that peace. You know, you're, 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 you're thinking about taking an action or going in a direction. And the more you think about it, you have this peace. You have this peace. You have this, you just, you just have this knowing. You have an attraction to doing that thing you're thinking about. You've prayed about it. It's, it's not against the word. See, I mean, you know, if something's against the word, don't pray about it. Just don't do it. I'm praying about getting a divorce. Well, that's not in the Word. You might get a divorce. I don't condemn anybody for having a divorce. Divorce happens to Christians. And, uh, and it may not be your fault, or it may be partially your fault, whichever way it is, but God can forgive you. God can help you. You don't have to, you know. I know one thing, if I live with some old scoundrel that was beating on me or, or cursing at me and, te- and depreciating me, I'd get out of there. That's a breaking of the covenant. That is, for, that, 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 is, that is allowed. That is allowed. Breaking of the co- marriage covenant. Anyway, so, uh, or else you're thinking about doing this thing or taking this direction and you lose your peace. You have a hesitancy. You, every time you think about it, you, you just... You just don't want to, you just, you're, you, you don't want to, you want to cooperate with God, but you, you, every time you think about doing this thing, whether it may be taking a, a, a transfer or, or buying a, a house or marrying somebody, you know, the Holy Ghost, is, well, he has a side. He has a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There are some decisions that you make. You're not going to insult God. It's just that it wasn't his best for you. He's still going to love you and he's still going to have a measure of blessing, but you can miss the perfect will of God. You know what? I don't want to settle for good. I want the perfect. I, I don't, if perfect will is available, that's what I want. And as one that had an acceptable will of God for a year in my life, and I remember how I was, it's like you know, it's like taking a bath with your socks on. It's, it's, it's a bath, but it doesn't feel that good. I spent a lot of extra time in prayer. I just couldn't have the measure of peace in my life. That whole time that I was in that situation where I'd made a decision and it brought me into the acceptable will of God. And then I stayed in that place until it became not even the will of God. I was out of the will of God for six months. I went from the acceptable, I came out of the perfect into the acceptable and then out of. And that's when I lost everything. I lost my finances. I lost my credit. I lost my houses. I lost my cars. I lost everything. We had to move in with my sister. 
thank God for my sister and her husband. Let us live with them. Then they moved out and moved away and we got to live there. Started paying way under the standard for the rent. Just had to get help them. I was unemployed most of the time. And when I wasn't employed, I was underemployed. Thank God that all changed. Today I've got yellow shoes on. Praise God. <laughs> Ostrich skin. Anyway. I thought I'd give the alligators a break. Praise the Lord. They got tired of being tread on. See, I, that, those days are over for me. Why? Because I learned. See, I had, to, I had to learn how. I had to learn the things I'm teaching you. I missed the witness expecting something more spectacular. Don't miss the supernatural looking for the spectacular. In fact, don't ask for the spectacular because the devil might give you, he might hack. And besides that, when I've had the spectacular and I, as a minister and as the, the offices that I stand in, I've had my share of visitations and spectacular leadership of the Holy Ghost, visions, dreams, trances, so forth and so on. And in every case, when I had those, it was rough sailing ahead. I had to have that kind of leadership so that I'd have something I could hang on to when things started, you know, coming against me. So be careful what you ask for. Just let, be content with the witness. It's all you need. That in the word, read your Bible. See, because the word and the spirit always are great. Did you get anything out of this now? So the spectacular, see, we, we, we get hung up on the spectacular. I want to say again, all four of these work together. Being filled with the spirit affects leading. Being filled with the spirit affects control. Being filled with the spirit affects, and I'm not even preaching on filled with the spirit. Maybe next week. Let me finish up the leading of the spirit. But I want you to know all four of these work together. In Acts 27, Paul is a prisoner of Rome. He's going in, you know, Jesus had appeared to him. And fear not, Paul, thou must stand before Caesar. And so the whole purpose of him being a prisoner was to get him an audience with the leader of the entire world and have a witness to him. Did he get saved? Well, the Bible doesn't say he got saved, but he won't have any excuse when he stands before God one day because Paul the apostle stood before him and gave his testimony. And while he was doing that, he got a lot of other people with a witness, Festus and King Agrippa and all these other people that he stood before and gave his testimony. Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Well, I wish that you almost and altogether was a Christian. I wish you were a Christian. He wasn't. No, he, he, didn't, he didn't bow. He, so they'll never be, see, our job is not to get people saved. Our job is to bring the witness to them. It's up to them whether they get saved. But if we have given them a witness, we've done our job. Are you with me now? So in Acts 27, on the eve of their taking, they're going to they're gonna take sail, and there's 180 some odd, 186 men on the ship. And, uh, and, and, and Paul comes out to the owner and the centurion of the ship and the centurion, the businessman and the military man. He says, sirs, I perceive that the, this voyage will be with much hurt, both to the lading of the ship and of our lives. And I recommend that you don't sail. Well, they didn't uh, pay any attention to the jailbird. He's a jailbird. What does he know? And they went ahead and sailed and they got right into this big storm and uh, called Eurachlodon. I don't know if it was a typhoon or, or what, but uh, it says in the middle of uh, the voyage, all hope that they should be saved was then taken away. Well, who took it away? God? No, the devil took it away. They're in bad shape. They're throwing stuff overboard. They're trying to lighten the ship. They're trying to get ready to, uh, to put the the, life rat, the lifeboats over the side and get in the lifeboats, but the waves are so big, tossed, and terrible, terrible storm. And at midnight, the angel of the Lord appeared. See, spectacular guidance. But what did he have before that? He said, I perceive. 
What is I perceive? That's the witness of the Spirit. The witness is a perception. It's an inter, into, in, inward intuition. Women know more about that than men. men. Women, you know, when you ask them why, how did you come to that decision? And they tell you, you go, wow. I don't even under, come close. I mean, women are from Mars, men are from Venus, whatever it is. They're <laughs> from a different planet. Men are like this. Chick, 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 chick. Everything's got to be lined up, reasonable. Women, they go right like, around the Cape of Good Horn, you know, all the way around. <laughs> Come back. And that's why I did it. I said, oh, okay, honey. <laughs> so, intuition. See, it's intuition. He had, he had that inward knowing. He didn't say God told him. He didn't say an angel appeared to him. But later, when all hope was taken away, the angel says, Fear not, Paul, for God has given all of them that sail with thee. <laughs> God's idea was they were sailing with Paul. Paul was the reason that ship existed. Paul was the reason they took the voyage to get him where? To Rome. They didn't get to Rome. They got to that island where they had the shipwreck. And they are all saved, every one of them, but the ship and all of its cargo. Can you imagine how much money that was that they lost because they didn't listen to the witness? Amen. And so uh, in order to follow the Holy Ghost, we, we then, you know, if you're going to follow the Holy Ghost, you've got to let him have control. See, that's, see how they work together? I mean, if you're just carnal and you're going to obey your flesh all the time, well, then what that does is harden your heart. And the receiver that's getting the signal is going to have snow. It's going to have static. I mean, you know, you, 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 you know, we travel, we go to San Antonio. I'm listening to a, you know, a station in Houston. And I, you know, I used to, I used to listen to Rush Limbaugh when he was on, so I'd, I'd put Rush on, and we'd get, we'd get halfway to San Antonio, and I couldn't hear Rush anymore, so I'd tune him in in San Antonio. See, you just get far from the signal. That's what happens when you walk in the flesh. You get, as it were, you create interference and static and distance between you and God to where you can't understand or follow his lead. You see how they work together. Praise God. Well, you know, we, we can train our bodies to be controlled by the Holy Ghost or be controlled by us because we're in charge. And we can learn how to obey the witness of the Spirit, identify when it comes. Or you're going to make mistakes. Sure, everybody makes mistakes in that area. But you know what? Praise God. God is able to take care of you. Thank God he takes care of me in grand style. How about you? He has mercy on us when we're young and, and we don't know what we are going to know. We're in the process. All of us are at different stages. But the Word of God and the Holy Ghost are the answer. Come on, lift your, lift your hands and receive. Praise God. Cooperating with the Holy Ghost. How many of you can, you're, you're committed to cooperating more fully with the Holy Ghost? How many of you learned something this morning that really is going to help you? And we all come up uh, with, with decisions to make. And, uh, and so, you know, we get, I'm arming you again. I'm arming you with ammunition. And in some cases, issuing you new weapons so that you can arrive at a godly decision of what it is that you're considering. 